Well, today's message is entitled, From Proof to Power. Last week, the message was entitled, How Much Proof Do You Need? And we really discussed that Jesus showed himself 10 times in within 40 days that he was alive. And up to at least 500 people that we know of, it's written about in 1 Corinthians 15. So he showed himself to over 500 people that he was alive. And this, this was intentional. And then after he ascended into heaven, the scripture records that he showed himself three other times to people. So in heaven, he showed himself once to Stephen. He looked up and he saw Jesus in his body. And then the, the, uh, the, the um, apostle Paul said that he also encountered Jesus personally in body. And then we also understand that, that John, when he wrote Revelation, he also encountered the, Jesus physically in writing Revelation. So three times after he ascended, Jesus again revealed himself. Thirteen times total. Well, today we're going to talk about from proof to power. I actually was thinking of skipping this message and going on to presence. That's where we're headed next week. But the, the Lord said no. You've got to include this because this is really a Pentecost message. I think the Lord's just kind of mixing everything up this year. I, I preached on Palm Sunday. I preached a Good Friday message. Obviously, last Sunday was about resurrection. And now this Sunday after Easter, here I'm preaching a Pentecost message right after Easter. So I'm not sure what I know what I'm, uh, I'm doing, but I know God knows what he's doing. So let's jump in today. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1 I'm going to be reading, uh, starting at verses 4 and uh, jumping through to um, 6. Let's see if I can find my glasses here stuffed in. We're all good. All right, so Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, when you, the, which you have heard about me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when... Uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is teaching there on one of the occasions he's revealing himself about the need and the necessity of his followers to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. How did he do this? Well, first of all, what he did was prior to his death, he began to teach his disciples about a transition that was coming. And the transition was that initially when they met him, they actually met Jesus in the flesh. They met him as a human being. That's how they related to God was through a person, a human being, a, a, an individual. And that's what they were used to. They were, they were used to relating to Jesus as a man. And Jesus begins to teach them starting in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 about there's going to be a transition when you will begin to relate to God through Holy Spirit, not as a man in a body anymore. He's still alive. He's in heaven. But here on earth, we begin to relate to God through the Holy Spirit. Now, when Adam was born, obviously he met, uh, he met with God face to face. And then there was a period of time when people really uh, walked with God through their understanding of their conscience. Whatever their conscience said was acceptable or, and how God, that's, that's kind of how they, they interacted with God. And then Moses came along and he wrote the law. And the law was written out and that's how they related to God through what was written in the law, the do's and the don'ts. Then Jesus came along as actual person and they began to relate to God as a person. And then finally, Jesus began to translate uh, or, tr or transition them over to relating to God through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so the, the, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just a, an entity or, or a ghost, so to speak. He is a person. He's just a person of God, the Spirit. And so as we look at this transition, uh, first of all, God came in the flesh to relate to us. John 1.14, this is very clear. 
Jesus, or it's written in the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of his one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 John 1 echoes the same thing. In fact, it goes into more detail. Same writer says this, That which was from the beginning, we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked at, and we have touched. This we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. The word appeared, and we have seen it, and testify it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and that appeared to us. So John is writing there about Jesus being in the flesh and how they related to him. The second point that I have is that Jesus prepared his disciples to relate to Holy Spirit. And he did this in John 14, 15, and 16. Let's look at John 14 here for a moment. 15 and 17 says this, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you. He will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. I don't know what your view or understanding of the Holy Spirit is. Sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as bringing us peace and bearing fruit. That's the true. Or maybe gifts that you've experienced the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or maybe just a good feeling. But Scripture talks about the Holy Spirit as being the Spirit of truth. That's kind of amazing, and sometimes it's not attributed because the word Spirit is attached. Sometimes we don't really believe that the Spirit has truth. And yet, in those three chapters in John, it always categorized. He does other things, but he's always categorized as the Spirit of truth truth. So he's bringing us into Jesus, which brings us into the Father. And I think that's really, really important to, uh, to understand that the Holy Spirit is the person of truth. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you'll do what I say. I want to ask you a couple of questions, the, just simple questions. And that is, do you believe that Jesus has in mind your greatest success? Do you think that he has in mind your full well-being? Do you think that his goal is to put in you, put you in the best position possible in order to bless you and honor him? Yes, yes, yes and yes. We would probably answer those questions. Now let me ask you some different questions. That is, do you think that the devil has in mind that you would live a victorious life? Do you think that demons have your best interest in mind? Does the world want to convince you that the Holy Spirit is just an option? Or perhaps even the church? Sometimes that can happen in denominational theology that we've grown up under, and it can happen. It creeps in. Sometimes it starts out well, and then over time it kind of morphs into this denominational thinking and begins to take Scripture that is plainly there, but it doesn't discuss it. In fact, and sometimes denominational theology actually explains away what Jesus says is vitally important. That's a problem. Uh, in my previous church, I had a couple that came and they were trying to find a church that was alive without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm like, good luck. So he gave me this book to read, and this author was talking about the Holy Spirit, which really limited him to just being born again. That's it. Uh, the Holy Spirit is involved in you being born again, and then it's just kind of up to you. You know, read Scripture and do the best that you can after that. So I was obliged him and read the book and got to the very end, and the author began to talk about how the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not needed today, and, and you know, all of that is just, it's just not necessary, not needed. We have the Word of God. We have what we need. We don't really need the Holy Spirit in that capacity. And I began to look at the sources of what they were using to document this point of view. And they were all Bible scholars. And the, and the Bible wasn't mentioned at all. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. I gave him back his book. He said, what would you think? I said, well, I think it's very interesting that they, they, the sources they used to say that the Holy Spirit wasn't necessary today were quoting Bible, Bible scholars rather than the Bible. He went, oh. I never thought about that before. I said, well, yeah, you better think about it. <laughs> Somebody in our congregation, I forget who, told me their father was in a denominational church that didn't teach or believe in the Holy Spirit. 
And for some reason, he began to read the Bible. And he read it from cover to cover. He got finished, and he told his family, we are leaving this church, and we're going to find a church that teaches about the Holy Spirit because the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. And they just, they left because the church wasn't going to change. And they said, we want to be in a place that teaches what Jesus taught. Not that we have it all together, but one thing we will do and continue to do is teach about the Holy Spirit. So we don't need to explain it away. We need to continue to uh, understand what Jesus had in mind. The next thing is that, that he commands his believers to wait until they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So Jesus rose from the dead. He's instructing them for 40 days. And then he says, during these 40 days, he said, I want you to not get into ministry. I know you're, you're excited that I'm alive. I know there's a lot of things to do in the world. But I do not want you to engage in ministry until you have been clothed, until you've been empowered, until you've been baptized in Holy Spirit. He said, don't leave the city until... And so the disciples decided to follow Jesus' instructions and not do that. A couple of scriptures there, John 16, 17. Jesus says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is clearly, again, giving his disciples a transition of how they would relate to God. John 16, 15, and 16 says, All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I say that the Spirit will receive from me and make it known to you. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me, and then a little while you won't see me, and in a little while you'll see me again. What in the world? The disciples are like, what is that? Well, Jesus, again, is explaining the fact that he's in body, and then he's going to leave, and then he will return in spirit through the Holy Spirit. Jesus will return back to earth. Number two, the disciples positioned themselves to receive the promised Holy Spirit. They actually put themselves in position to receive. What did they do? After Jesus left, went through the clouds, there was a 10-day period of time. And it says that they went to the upper room and they simply prayed. I'm sure they ate. Maybe they fasted for a period of time. But it said that they were constantly in prayer. It wasn't just the 12 disciples. Well, it was actually 11 at that time. I'll get to that. But it was 120 believers that had joined together. And they were praying. They were waiting for this empowering of the Holy Spirit to come. So they prayed, number one. That's how they positioned themselves. And so if you want to receive the Holy Spirit into your life, position yourself in prayer. Prayer opens us up to be able to hear what God has to say. And then the second thing is they got into governmental order. Well, what does that mean? They actually read the scripture, and the scripture said that Judas Iscariot, that took his life in, in, the, in the process of... of, uh, of of um, denying or betraying Jesus took his life and they said he must be replaced and so they read out of Psalms it doesn't say in scripture that Jesus instructed them to do that maybe the Holy Spirit was already at work and they said the scripture says in Psalms that we need to replace Judas and so that's what they did they they selected two men the qualifications were they needed to have been with them since the beginning so the 12 was not the only ones around Jesus. There were others around. So they selected two guys, Matthias and Barnabas. And they said, uh, now these two guys, they were with us from the start. They hung around. They, you know, they were on the porch when we were inside. They were hearing everything all the way through the end. And they selected these two guys. And then they prayed. And God selected Matthias to join the original 12. So they put themselves in governmental order. What does that mean today to be in governmental order? Well, I was, I was pondering that. I said, I really feel like to be in governmental order for us today would be to be in covenant member with the body of Christ. To be a covenant member, it puts us in governmental order. Not just in covenant with God the head or Jesus the head, but to be in covenant with his body. To say, I am, this is my family. This is my body. I want to commit to them. Be in covenantal order. That would be like a governmental view in, in my book. I didn't really grow up in a church that taught about the necessity and need of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't really until my late 20s 
that uh, I began to learn about Holy Spirit. I began to learn about who he was and how he worked. And, and uh, so actually the way it took place for me in my mid-20s, I was going, getting ready to go to sleep at night in my bed. I just prayed. I said, Holy Spirit, come and fill me. And something happened that night. He came and filled me, and life began to change at that point. And I, I had some tough things that I encountered after that. But what happened is when I encountered those tough things, those tough things drew me closer to God, not further away. And I'm convinced it was because the Holy Spirit was in my life that when I encountered those tough situations that I couldn't move through or work through, I was actually drawn closer to God rather than further away. And so you might ask yourself, if you're encountering tough things this morning, are you being drawn closer to God or further away? If you say, I'm being drawn further away, then you need more of the Holy Spirit because he will only draw you closer to God and he'll take those things that, that the enemy is meant to destroy us with and he'll turn them around for good. That's what God does through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Now, number three, what if the disciples had not obeyed Jesus? What if they just said, oh, forget that. That's optional. He's optional. Let's just jump in. What would have happened? I, I, I think of four things that, that could have happened. First of all, in Luke 24, 49, Jesus says, I am going to send to you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Again, Jesus is telling his disciples, you need to be prepared for the Holy Spirit coming. So four things that I think that... Uh, would, if, if they would not obeyed, what would have happened? The first thing is they would have violated a direct command of Jesus. That's what, I mean, because he clearly told them to stay. They understood that. If they would have said, oh, the Holy Spirit's an option. Let's just minister. Anyhow, they would have violated a direct command of Jesus. Now, what happens when you violate a command? You don't get the blessing of of, of obeying that command. That's what happens. Every time Jesus says that we need to do something, there's a blessing that is included in that. And when you say, no, I'm not going to do that, you miss the blessing. That's essentially what happens in not, uh, in, in, in not uh, obeying a direct command. The second thing I think about is that we have, we're limited to our own understanding. If, if we're not including Holy Spirit in on our life, we're limited to our own understanding. I want to read you from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9 through 11. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. The amazing thing that I understand, the truth that I understand about having Holy Spirit active in my life is I have access to the thoughts of God. That's powerful when you think about it. You have access to the thoughts of God through Holy Spirit. Obviously, this word that's written down is the thoughts of God. But what happens is that when I read these written words, there's something more than just words. There's life in these words. There's direction in these words. There's hope in these words. There's faith that I encounter in these words. There's love that comes back to me in these words. That's Holy Spirit at work. And so if they had not obeyed Jesus, they would have been limited to their own understanding. The next is they would have been restricted to the law with no life. What a bummer. To back to Old Testament ways of living. Just follow the law. Oh, I, 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 I made it today. Oh, I did make it today. Oh, I made it. Oh, I did make it today. And in that kind of yo-yo type of, of, of relationship with God, you just are stuck with obeying or disobeying the law. And that's what have happened. No, it's way more than that. It's a relationship that we enter with God and the Holy Spirit makes that real. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant not of the letter of the law but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life 
Wow, what a scripture. And then the last thing I think about if they had not obeyed Jesus' command is no miracles would be possible. What a bummer. No miracles possible without the Spirit. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul writes when he says in Galatians 3, 2 through 5, he said, I would like to, to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? So again, I ask, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So the Holy Spirit is a miracle-working God. And without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we don't have miracles. They don't exist, or they rarely exist. I found this article written by a Catholic father about uh, how the Holy Spirit is involved in our lives or what would happen if he wasn't involved. And I had to make a few tweaks along the way because some of what he written was plainly Catholic doctrine. (laughs) So I had to, again, pull it back into Scripture as I understand it. But for the most part, it was really good. I want to read it to you this morning as a way of encouragement and also affirmation of why we need Holy Spirit in our life. He says, Indeed, without the sending of the Spirit of God, the Father, there is no church, no mission, no grace of salvation, no fulfillment of the work of Christ. As Jesus himself said to the apostles, it is to your great advantage that I go so the Holy Spirit can come. The Holy Spirit gives us the new life of heavenly grace, intimacy with God, the pledge of eternal life. In communion, it is the translation of the Holy Spirit that the bread and the wine are received as the body and blood of Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, we would not be born again and therefore have no power to witness to Jesus and to his gospel. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be only division and confusion in the church. We should pause there and say, if there's division and confusion in the church, it's probably a lack of the Holy Spirit at work. Let me continue. He says, for it is he who... For it is He that binds us together in love, meaning the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we would have no understanding of God and the mystery of salvation. For it is He that gives us intelligence about the plan of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be motionless in our own tracks. For it is He that directs our journey and points us in the right direction. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be mince meat for our adversaries. For it is He that defends us from our enemies. Without the Holy Spirit, we could not pray. For it is He who prompts and enables us in prayer. Without the Holy Spirit, we would have no love, joy, peace, patience, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. For these are the fruit of the Spirit. And I added this. Without the Holy Spirit, we would not have His gifts of word of wisdom and knowledge, faith, healings, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, speaking in tongues and interpretation thereof. The Holy Spirit seals our inheritance. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no resurrection from the dead. For Paul writes, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and raises our mortal bodies. We begin and end our life in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We pass from death to life in the power of the Holy Spirit. We live and breathe each day in the love of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, no spirit, no church. Wow. That's just full of scriptures, really, without the chapter verse of what he writes. The need and necessity of the Holy Spirit. Number four, because they did receive Holy Spirit, what happened? And what will happen to us? Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. My point there is simply this. I could say a lot more. 
But my point there is that when they received the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus returned to advocate or advance the kingdom of God. When they received the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus, he's still living in heaven, but his presence is just as real, just as tangible, just as life-changing as if he was here in body when the Holy Spirit returned and filled the believers that were open that day. And the same thing will happen to you and I as we open ourselves to receive Holy Spirit in our lives. The presence of Jesus comes and fills our life's life and begins to show us his way. A couple of scriptures there in Acts. Um, Jesus told his disciples, in a little while you'll see me, in a little while you won't see me. Again, I mentioned the fact that he would return in a different form, but the same person, so to speak. In Acts 2, later on, 17 and 18, it says, In the last days God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And so the Holy Spirit came and filled the believers, empowered the believers. And if you've ever continued reading through Acts, I'm actually reading the book of Acts right now, and I've noticed how much those, those followers of Jesus who were still hiding away from fear of, of the Jews or fear of the, 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 those that follow Judaism, and yet when the Holy Spirit came, there was a boldness. There was a confidence. There was a, an assurance that Jesus was living. And they were engaged again to advance the kingdom of God as Jesus start out and called them to do. And the same thing will happen to us as his church today. As we are empowered with the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus told his followers then. He tells us now. Before we move out, we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Whatever term you use, whether it's baptized, whether it's filled, whether it's empowered, all of it means the same thing, that Jesus comes and fills our life and directs our life just as if Jesus was here in body. That's how he said it would happen. And so the disciples found that true. My question for you is, have you ever been baptized, filled? Have you ever had someone pray over you that you would be filled with the presence of Jesus in your life? Lots of times we come into church and we talk about being born again, and that's vitally, vitally important. When, when the church was being established, they taught about the good news that Jesus died for our sins so that we could be free. That was a starting place, but it wasn't the stopping place. It was just the place where we all started. And then uh, if you read down through the book of Acts, you can see that the apostles came down after they were born again and prayed for the believers to be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. And more changes took place in their life as a result of that. And so it's just really a continuation of the born again experience is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not in place of, it's actually a continuum, a, a step, just like water baptism, spirit baptism. And then we learn how to hear the voice of God and we walk forward in faith and confidence and hope in each day. I, I see uh, my friend Elizabeth back there. She shared last Sunday about uh, a meeting that was being held in her, her local church where they live. They drive in from a distance. And, and she said that she had actually been diagnosed with four different issues that were really uh, debilitating for her. She couldn't really go through day without several naps. And, and, and it was just, just rough. And so the pastor that night just called for those that, that had the, the certain kind of, of thing that she was encountering and, and had. And so... She just, he said, pray this prayer. As I understood the prayer, it was a very simple prayer. Like, Heavenly Father, you love me. That's all it was. Like, Heavenly Father, you love me. And she said, all of a sudden, something, she sat down. She said, all of a sudden, something began to happen that never happened before. She's described as electricity that was running up and through her body as Jesus was healing her. And then she began to think, I need to forgive myself for being sick. So she actually forgave herself for being sick. 
And she's in this process now, and she got up from that time, and she's like, something's changed, and she shared with me this morning. Uh, he, her husband feels like he's got a new wife. I mean, it's just amazing in their home about how the simplicity of Jesus meeting this person with this issue and how the change has taken place. She said, I'm a new woman. I've been healed. Jesus touched me this day. And yet she went through about, I don't know how many, four years, three or four years of this four years of that struggling through but then all of a sudden that day I don't I don't know why that day God met her and set her free and and I, I asked her again this I, 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 I kind of stole the testimony in the first service she wasn't here but I asked her permission to share it today in this service she's here what an amazing what an amazing God that we serve it's a miracle serving uh, God because of Holy Spirit being active and he knows exactly what we need and even in the waiting period God will sustain us I mean it, it yeah it gets weary in the walking and the waiting but when Holy Spirit is involved he empowers you to take that waiting not as a oh God when are you going to come through as God maybe today that's when the Holy Spirit's involved. God, maybe today. You wake up every day and say, God, maybe today. That kind of faith and hope and assurance that God is a good God and he wants our best in mind. Again, I go back to my question. And that is, have you ever had someone pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What I'm going to do in a few moments, if you've never had someone, is just to stand where you're at. And those believers around you are just going to come and gently lay hands. We had several in the first service. And just lay hands on you. And I'm going to have, have you recite a prayer with me of just opening up your heart. That's, that's how the disciples received. They just simply, they were in a place of prayer. But that place of prayer opened up their heart to obey Jesus and want all that he had for them to live this life. And I want all that, all that God has for you in living this life. I don't, I don't want to be accused of, of holding back uh, uh, anything that God says that you can have or we can have. I, I want you to have it all. God wants to bless you even more than, than what you can imagine. Again, I, I ask that question. I'll invite you to stand here in a few moments. But even beyond that, I believe that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit but reach a place in our life where it feels like that we can't go any further. It's like a, a brick wall. That, that it's like we need a breakthrough of something that, that, we're, that we're facing and it just won't move. At that place, I believe, now I've done this in my life. At that place, I believe, Holy Spirit, come and show me. Fill me. Show me what is need, needed to happen so that this which is in front of me can be broken through your way, not my way. Not, not anybody else's way, but your way. God, come and do that. And I've done that time and time again. And God has been faithful. I can say, I can testify that God has been faithful. Every time I've reached this place of saying, it, I don't know how it's going to change. God, come and fill me and show me he's been faithful to come through. And we're going to invite anybody that just needs a breakthrough. Just as Chris shared in the first service, that sometimes in a, in a breakthrough, there's an impact. <laughs> And sometimes we're afraid of the impact. You know? What's going to happen? What are they going to think? What, 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 what's going to... Listen, God's a good God. <laughs> He's got such... He, he only brings good gifts to you. That's all he does. So we're going to have those that have never been invited. And, and you feel like in your heart you want to be open this morning. Again, this is an opportunity. It's not a, not a mandate. It's, I'm not forcing anything on you. Neither would God. But it's an opportunity, if you've never been prayed for, to just to stand. And then, and then after that, we're going to invite elder team. Would you be available as well as the ministry team? We're going to invite anybody to come forward here that say, I'm at a place I need a breakthrough. And we're going to pray, Holy Spirit, come and do your work. We had a couple of testimonies in the first service because we just had some extra time. A couple of service. And uh, it, was, it was just great seeing God already at work. So he loves you and he wants to pour out his best for you. So if you've never been prayed for, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, filling of the Holy Spirit, and something inside of you is saying, I'd like that today. I'd like to be, I'd like to, to receive that person of the Holy Spirit and be guided in my life. Just stand where you're at, if you would. Just stand up and we'll, we'll pray and ask the Holy Spirit. 
all right? Thank you, Lord. That's great. Anybody else? Somebody standing, those around them, would you just reach out your hand and touch them? Thank you, Lord. that are, are, are standing for the first time, would you just say this prayer, repeat this prayer with me out loud. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus told his followers to wait until they receive the power from on high. I'm ready to receive my empowering from the Holy Spirit. In faith, I open up my heart to be baptized into the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sending Holy Spirit so that I can be empowered to witness and to live victoriously. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just come and fill those that have opened their heart this morning, God. Lord, I pray that you would just descend and love them, bring them a peace. Lord, you know exactly how you want to reveal yourself to these individuals standing today. You've got a perfect plan in mind for their life. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that as they have opened their heart to receive God, that you would come and fill them in a fresh way. Thank you, Lord, for the believers standing around them as a testimony that you have done it for them and you can do it for them today, God. Thank you, Father, that they're on a new path today, a path of new faith, new hope, new love like never before, God. Thank you for meeting them in this moment, Lord. Continue to empower them as they walk with you and talk with you along life's narrow way. God, continue to empower them with fresh revelations of your love for them, the way you want to lead them, and bring them into all truth. Thank you, Lord, for their open hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you. If you're here this morning, and uh, elder team and also uh, ministry team, if you would come and join me. And if you say, I just need to pray for a breakthrough. Maybe you prayed yesterday for that breakthrough, but I declare today by, by the Spirit of the Lord, today is a new day. Today is not yesterday. Today is a new day. And you say, I need... I need a breakthrough in my life. And, and I'm, I'm just asking the Lord to come. To come and to, to reveal himself in a fresh way. Those of you that are, are waiting, just, you just, just begin praying. If you don't need a breakthrough, hallelujah. Just, but if you do, come. This is a safe place. This is a place where God is just ministering his peace. It's a place where we've given uh, focused attention to the Holy Spirit. And so he's willing and ready to pour out. And he's inviting you to come just as, just as individuals to come and receive from him.